Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is David Dedakian, and with me today is Matt Simmons. I want to say bartender extraordinaire, but you do so much more, so I don't want to just limit it to bartender. I, I, want, to, I want to hear it from you. Uh, I know you, you represent some brands, you, you, know, you, you do some consulting, uh, all sorts of things on the, the, the bar side of the equation uh, when it comes to food and drink. Uh, so it's, it's a pleasure having you here today, Matt. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you much, very much for having me. Happy to be here, David. So I like to start off every interview with a little bit about your background, like where you came from, where you grew up, your family, that sort of thing. So why don't you tell everyone a little bit about where, where, where's, where's Matt from? Um, I'm originally hailing from South Kingston, Rhode Island, um, the Matunic Beach area, uh, Green Hill to be specific. Um, I was raised in Providence, Rhode Island, but spend most of my summers in Matunic where I'm from. Um, I went to LaSalle Academy. I studied at CCRI, Rhode Island College, and Brown University uh, in that order. Um, I've spent most of my, you know, adolescent and adult life in Providence uh, and worked there for uh, most of that time period as well. Um, that's my education and background, I guess, in a nutshell. Um, my preliminary professional life started in uh, money, finance, banking. Um, I was a commercial banker, a business banking officer. And the last job I had in that industry was in the late 2010s, and I was a senior market analyst for a brokerage house, a company that mitigates risk for private companies that are domestic and abroad, uh, taking care of their data and making sure that um, we're making sound money, sound uh, decisions with their dividends. Right, Lately, yeah. That's... I've been in food and beverage and hospitality for a little over a decade at this point. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, you've mentioned that to me before, and that's fascinating, you're, you're, the background there, the banking background. What, um, what I mean, it seems almost, almost obvious to anyone in food and beverage, but what made you decide banking's not for me? Um, there's one, one story, and I'll, I'll keep it consolidated. I deviated a non-compete. Um, I was very quietly uh, working um, moonlighting, literally, uh, against the non-compete for the private bank. Um, and I was working part time at Bacara restaurant and, um, and then I helped, uh, open the doors as a bar back and, and, uh, part time bartender here and there when they first got started in, I picked my head up out of the drink well one night and I was literally looking at my two directs that owned the private bank. Um, the, an aforementioned, um, Commonwealth foreign exchange, which used to be across from 10 steak and sushi. Uh, that led to a, a Jerry Maguire conversation, a uh, very famous scene where Jay Marr excuses, uh, uh, Tom Cruise's character in that movie from his job. I brought you to fire, brought you here to fire you, Jerry. And that was not the dialogue we had, but it became very clear to them and clear to me at that time that I needed to re-examine my professional choices as I was being well paid uh, to not be seen in public where I might encounter clients. Um, after just a couple of months of bartending competition and a lot of soul searching and some conversations with my family and educators, I decided that I needed to follow my heart in my by then mid twenties and go for it. Uh, and my path then took me from every front of house role you can imagine and some short stints back of house. So I knew um, the people I was supporting and working around. And uh, it, it led me from bar backing, bartending, uh, serving, high end serving, uh, light consulting, heavy consulting, program development, um, to the point where now I represent uh, local and national brands in the area, uh, consulting them on placement, menu style, um, in-house service training, you name it. I just kind of kept going. Uh, but that's how I ended up here. And that's sort of a light example or light examples of how my process has brought me to where I'm at. No, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a great story. It really is a, a testament to what you wanted to do and, and, and where you wanted to go with, with your, your life and your career and, you know, and, and the change. It's a, it's a product of playing scared, David. Uh, I, you know, if you just want to go into food and beverage because you feel passionate about it and you have a knack for it, you don't say, hey, I want to be a consultant in 10 years or, or I want to own a restaurant in 10 years. It just sort of happens. Right. So I'm where I'm at, and this is just sort of what's happened. And I've, anytime I get a compliment or a question like you're asking me, again, thank you for having me this morning. I always, I always look right to the people that influence me. Uh, Brian Kingsford, uh, Jamie G. Oliveira, Dan Becker, uh, the, the Lester family. Anyone that's given me a shot in this business has given me the opportunity to get better and work and become more seasoned. And that's really what's helped me to get to where I'm at. Well, you named some great people, great friends. Uh, I Absolutely. think, you know, it's a testament to our community. It is. 
you know, we've got an amazingly strong and helpful community here. It's robust to say the least. Uh, the not irony, but um, the, the the nice reflection you can have about our restaurant and bar environments are that for being so small, we are so robust and um, we are all competing with each other, but also we're a really tight knit community that wants to prop each other up. And I feel that the competition as well as the parody go hand in hand every night, every service. Absolutely. No, it's very true. I, I've had the, the luxury of <clears throat> doing uh, interviews and stories in Boston and New York and it's a lot more competitive. Uh, in, in, I mean, not that it's not competitive here. You're right. Uh, you know, there's some competition here, obviously, just to, you know, obviously stay in business and, and, and move forward. There's always going to be that. But it's different here. Uh, it's, it's definitely a lot more uh, camaraderie than, uh, than some other places. I would agree. Um, if you think about, um, you know, the process of um, Billy Moon, who was cooking all kinds of bistros downtown, she had for a time a restaurant on Hope Street. Uh, called Blaze Restaurant, where Wara right. Wara is now, or Derek Wagner of Nixon on Broadway. He, he cooked at XO, I believe, for a time. Um, a lot of small private owners, you know, <laughs> have a similar path of, to my, uh, that my own was, or, or is rather, excuse me. And I think that a, our environment like Boston politely does not allow for that. Um, the intimate close proximity and nature of the environment that Providence provides as a community is how people go from working in a place becoming a partner in a program and then opening their own um and there i mean the, the examples are countless in providence you can oh, go yeah. on and on yeah no absolutely true and now uh, there's there's tons and tons i mean it's 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 wonderful to see and it's great you know to see all the success here uh and 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 obviously you know we'll talk you know a little bit about the times we're in but you know hopefully it, it continues uh you know th these times are going to unfortunately, you know, bring some folks down. But I think because of the strength of our community, because of the camaraderie, because of uh, how tight knit everyone is, uh, we have a better chance here than a lot of places. Yep. Yeah, I absolutely believe in that as well. So that's restaurants and bars. Tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, the products and things of that nature that you work with. Okay. So I, um, I've been really lucky and this is where it's just my, been my interest point that's kind of brought me into products. Um, People would ask me why I use certain products to prepare certain drinks or write certain recipes. And I always let people know that, hey, excuse the cat in the background. Um, I always let people know that I won't consume or wouldn't look to consume anything that I would not feel good about consuming. And it wouldn't be inherently my process and it would go against my integrity and intention to offer you something that I wouldn't enjoy or feel good sharing with you. Um, I think that small private businesses have a unique opportunity to buy what they want and sell what they want. Uh, corporate oversight, larger entities to save money and grow, they have initiatives that don't allow for that. So always working in small private settings, I've always had examples of chefs, cooks, managers, uh, directors, uh, for lack of better words, that gave me the opportunity to work with local stuff. Um, and as kitchen shrubs, uh, organic kitchen shrubs, which are great in salad dressings or cocktail mixers are available through Sid Wainer. Um, Toma Bloody Mary mix out of New York is another product I work with. Alejandro Lopez and the team at Pestano Foods have a beautiful Bloody Mary mixer. Um, they're in the region. They're in Connecticut, New York, New Jersey. And now I brought them into Rhode Island. Um, Broken Shed Vodka out of New Zealand is available exclusively in the Northeast and down into the Mid-Atlantic. They're larger, um, but I am happy to handle some of the representation here and maintain that relationship as I, again, believe in these products. Um, those are just two or three examples. Um, I just feel like if you wouldn't feed it to your kids or your dog, why would you give it to your wife or your cousin or your nephew or your parents? Um, you know, and nothing against Tito's. Uh, it's a great story Tito's has, but Tito's isn't the best thing for you. So I like to always have an answer and an opportunity to show someone something better. And not because I have an ego about knowing more or having access to more, but I think that knowledge is power. If you can feel good about what you're consuming and you know where it came from and how it benefits you, why the person sharing with you brought it to your attention, I think that's where you find value. And that's the value of small private establishments. You know, the bistros, uh, bars, and, and uh, restaurants in, in our city and in the greater surrounding area. Again, I go back to small private consortium owners that have a unique responsibility to pull in the local dollars. And the only way you do that is to create a relationship based on trust offering products and services that are not germane uh, to larger entities. And right. uh, that is sort of the, the bioeconomics of what, greater Rhode Island's food and beverage scene offers. And um, what's brought me into to operating with those products is 
recognizing my market and my environment and honoring it. And I mean that. That's that's why I work with smaller local brands. I try my best to to look at the field I'm in and, and support that through those brands. Absolutely. No, it's it's a, it's a lot of what I do. Uh, you know, you can't. You know, it'll, you know, somebody's just put your money where your mouth is, uh, and and you you use these products yourself, and you you, you know you've grown to know them best and you love them for, you know, for what they are. And they're, you know, there's other bigger, like you said, bigger brands out there that, that are just, I won't say worse, but different uh, from what you want to have. Uh, Maybe just not for you. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, Nana's Kitchen Scrubs is a great story. I mean, I, I love that product. It, it's fascinating to see the, the emergence of that type of product over the last few years. Uh, you know, it's, again, knowing Anna and knowing having had her at my festival and tasting all their products, you know, not only are they what you want to have quality wise, but they're also delicious. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I have to say, I couldn't agree more. The cranberry mint and the banana turmeric. Um, that banana turmeric is great. Man. Um, you want to talk about versatile, diverse stuff doesn't go bad. It, you know, it's something you don't may not use a lot, but it can just sit on a shelf or in your fridge because of how it's produced. Um, it, there's a lack of preser preservatives there, which I we all appreciate. Yeah, something that can keep you healthy in the long run, um, and you can use it anytime. Um, great example, David. Yeah, no, I, I really like it a lot. And and the diversity, like you said, you know, I haven't used it in soups, but that's an interesting idea. I want to check that out. But you know, from cocktails to non-alcoholic yeah. drinks. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Do you find uh, bars? You know, a lot of places now you know, are a little more, are, are you know, do it themselves, uh, make their own mixers and things of that nature. Do you find markets for these things here, or is it a little bit of a struggle? I do. Sometimes? I do. Um, I, I think that um, you, you you know your audience. Uh, I think that in, in sales and when you're sharing, there's a fine line between educating and helping people and telling them how to do something. Right. But I know where that line in the sand is because you want to honor your target and also honor your efforts and not waste anyone's time, including your own. Um, I, I find that there are places that do such a high level of volume that their visibility is way up. So if you do brunch every Sunday and it's your busiest service, maybe it makes sense to order a product, you know? Um, whereas if you're doing brunch service and it's your third busiest shift of the week, but you need that to get in, get in that service and fill it at least one turn to cover costs. Maybe you make your own. Um, I think that understanding environment to environment, um, the importance of a style. If you're going to bring a product into an environment, you're going to offer your services or portfolio, which I may do. Um, you got to sit back and go, what's the valuation of my products to this environment? And how am I going to help their check average and their reputation as a reliable place to relax and enjoy and restore? Um, that is what everyone wants to achieve as a small private owner. Um, and I think that anything short of that is unacceptable. Hopefully our distributors in the area, we'll name nameless, leave nameless for sake of conversation, are doing that. I think that case incentives are great when it comes to providing you know, a case of bubbles for that brunch service because you ordered a case of our Bloody Mary mixer. That's great, but if that case of bubbles doesn't do you well, you really don't need that Bloody Mary mixer, let's let them make their own stuff. Let's right. go on to the next target and let them know if they need anything else, you give us a call. You leave a card on the table and you walk away. Um, something that's really good about Rhode Island is for being small and petite and on paper really should be a desolate landscape is that people living and working here understand what works for them and they subscribe to the goods and services in the region that really engender success for their brand and satisfaction and reliability in the minds of their customers. And we don't deviate from that. Uh, there, there's a reason that we don't have a lot of neon signs in downtown Providence. There's a reason uh, we don't have huge billboards everywhere. It's because um, the local brands that do well have really good lines of communication with the on-premise and off-premise targets. And people quietly get their work done without blasting, without forcing something in front of the consumer. And you'll notice when we do do that, we don't need to mention who's failed. It's not classy to. There is failure, usually attached to forcing yeah. the issue. Um, the reason that an Anna's Kitchen Shrub is viable and okay, the reason that Toma Bloody Mary Mix is doing well, the reason that Granny Smith's Yacht Club Soda, other entities like this, they find themselves in the places they ought to be 
through gently engendering relationships and arriving in the glass or on the plate. Um, things happen appropriately when they're supposed to. Right. Absolutely. Oh, I, and, and Yacht Club's a great example. You know, it's not, it's still, it's fascinating to me how, you know, it's been around for 105 years and there's still a lot of people that don't know about it, but it's, it's there, it's present. Uh, and, you know, if you want that alternative and, you know, he's got 30 something flavors, it's there and yeah. it's fantastic. Hopefully and I'm John, gonna have, yeah, I was going to say, hopefully I'm going to have John on, on, on next, uh, the next episode. I, I, you should have him on soon. I mean, you want to talk about a guy yeah. who's very understated yeah. family guy, but man, is he fun. What a fun guy. Oh yeah, no, John's a great friend and, uh, I love working with them. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's nice to see products like that be able to survive and thrive, uh, in this day of, you know, mega everything. And he's ultra specific. You want to talk about not to jump into cocktails, but what a great mixer. If you don't want to do what I do at home or maybe what you, you and I do, David, to get so specific with our at home consumption, you want to grab a specific flavor, you just go right to him and he has it. And that's yeah. really cool. Yeah. No, absolutely. No, they're, they're fantastic uh, mixing sodas and, and seltzers. Uh, it's, it's something to say. But we'll save that conversation for John. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, well, let's talk a little bit about, so you obviously you create a lot of cocktails yourself. You, you bartend still uh, regularly. Um, what, how has that evolved? How have you seen that over the last 10 years uh, grow? For, for myself, for, for myself, you mean, or like within the, the, the industry? Well, both. Um, I, I think that, uh, the cocktail, the cocktail movement of, of West to East, uh, late 2010s into early 2000 teens, um, was really a bit of a, a tidal wave from basically San Francisco, um, carried by bourbon, uh, initially. And when it arrived here, you know, we basically had cook and Brown on Hope Street for those who recall and remember, yeah, that um, was, great that was our first. I would, yeah, I was, I was just finishing up, uh, at Brown and I was working in, in, in the business world and. Um, the first time I saw someone stir a drink in front of me, I mean, and I was, I was in my mid twenties at that point, it still was just getting here. Um, the evolution of it has really been incredible. Um, I would like to thank Dan Becker and the ownership team at Ogie's trailer park for bringing me on as the cocktail guy in 2015. I had a two and a half year stint there. Um, the volume at which they, uh, passed out their, their goods and services and wares there allowed them to have access to all kinds of obscure bottles for free from their suppliers. So I would see Bowles Watermelon. I would see Ancho Reyes. I would see stuff that belonged in a high-end cocktail bar in another state far, far away that would just now be arriving on a shelf at a Dorrance or an Eddie. Um, and getting access to those products in 2015, I can't believe it's been five years, um, almost five years, excuse me, really gave me the opportunity to mess around. I had a girlfriend at the time that would bring me fresh blueberries. Um, so I started doing blueberry tequila and, and lemon sodas. Um, I was bowls, watermelon liqueur, which I just itemized. I would mix with lemon, uh, a little bit of tequila, club soda, powder pink, delicious. And at 10 bucks, you can't beat it. Um, my own personal evolution was in a high volume establishment being the guy that was asked to stir you something, to shake you something, to create you something. And fortunate for me to that, at that point, I had developed enough of a palette that no disrespect to my cohorts sharing the space with me. I was wearing a shirt and tie and they were wearing a beanie and flannel and they're going to grab you a beer and a shot and talk to you about your day. I'm going to be busy stirring your girlfriend a drink. And that rigorousness really developed um, an ability I already had, but uh, almost a routineness about looking at the bar, asking you a couple quick questions, looking at what was behind me, what I had access to, and then going to work. Did it have acid? Did it need to be stirred? Did it need to be shaken? And always sticking to the rules of building a cocktail the right way. Ice last, acid last, engage the customer, and make sure that you make it right, you make it delicious the first time, every time. Um, I carried that into Mills Tavern. Um, I, I am not the bar lead at Mills Tavern. Uh, Jake DeShalom is the lead there. Uh, we work very closely together to develop a really beautiful cocktail list. Uh, and, cure, and the wine curation is also equally well handled. Uh, but as far as my own personal development of, of becoming a creative mixologist, I have to tip my hat to my laterals and contemporaries. I have to consider Jay Carr and Jesse Hedberg and Jen Davis. I have to uh, you know, think about Kevin over at Persimmon. People that really have a refined palate and a refined taste and a consideration for appropriate ice and glassware. And really, really consider that Rallon's a small space and there are not a lot of opportunities or spaces um, where we can share 
And there, as such, there aren't a lot of opportunities to do that. Um, this is not New York City. This is not the Carolinas. This is not Chicago, where there's 3.3 million people and a cocktail bar on every corner. Um, I think that Rhode Islanders that work in our field that do what I do and, and David enjoy what you enjoy have a very unique responsibility. And I mean that um, any development I have, not from necessarily creating, but from sticking to the rules before creating has allowed me to execute and execute well. I have to thank the folks at El Tesoro Tequila for having me in Chicago as a national finalist last year. But I was inspired by Corey Hayes. Um, of, of formerly of Gurney's in Newport and currently works with the Mission Burger folks, uh, TSK and uh, Winner Winner. And they're about to uh, expand again. Right. Um, working with him for a summer really brought um, a consciousness for, add, uh, reminded me rather of a consciousness for additives, uh, for simplicity. You don't always need a garnish. It's my style to always use a garnish. You don't need to. Um, forgive me for being long-winded when I answer the question. But, no, it's, um, that's, my, that's what the show's about. My development and creativity is indicative of, again, the laterals and contemporaries. I've been very, very fortunate. Um, who take it seriously the way I do. Uh, they've all taught me a lot. And hopefully um, I'm at the point where I'm now teaching people as well. That's fantastic. No, it's great. You brought some great examples up, obviously, of some fantastic people. Uh, yep. You know, I think Newport uh, sometimes gets uh, thought of as, especially during the summer months, you know, the, you know, it's the land of gin and tonic, David. Yeah, the well, land I was going to say espresso martinis. I was going to be a little nicer. Um, that, which, that, yeah, that, there's nothing wrong with an espresso martini. Uh, but, it, but what Corey's doing, uh, the wines at TSK also are fantastic. Great list. Uh, I, I, I was there around Christmas time. Quick tip of the hat. Time. Quick tip of the cap to Mr. Ian Majeros. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, key, account, key account specialist and wine expert at MS Walker absolutely has a lot to do with supporting Corey, who is very independent-minded as well in his environments, but. Uh, pardon me for interrupting. I just wanted to drop. No, no, it's it's okay. I, I, I uh, of course, Ian's a dear friend, and and I love to. I hope to have him on this too, though. I think that would be like a three, four hour show. Me, <laughs> me and Ian. Gift <laughs> uh, the gab, gift uh, the gab. But I also want to shout you. You mentioned some great folks, uh, Jesse at Bar and Board. Yeah. Really, just I mean, his palette spot on. The things he can create, super on chill and understated. And uh, I hope he doesn't mind me saying so. But if you catch him out for a drink, he's good with a vodka and soda and a shot. And he's and he's you know he's very understated and chill. You know he loves a really good, well crafted drink. But yeah, yeah. Um, wh whether it's we don't trust people or we don't want to bother people, you will very rarely find a lot of those people I just mentioned enjoying a craft cocktail out or asking someone to make them one. I often feel a little guilty about my expectations and as such, I don't want to concern people with what I'd like to have. I keep it simple. Um, and Jesse's one of those people too, that he turns the lights up for you at work, but they get turned down when he leaves. And um, I really respect that a lot about him. No, it's very true. Uh, we were there end of the last year uh, with friends of ours visiting from Arizona and uh, we were just, you know, catching up. We hadn't seen each other in ages. Uh, and uh, with my friend from, from Arizona, uh, we were talking about the Mandalorian TV show and just chatting. And Jesse's behind the bar doing his thing, helping other customers, obviously. And then dropped down <laughs> the perfect. I I've seen a lot of pictures. Uh, you know, we've all seen them, the, 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 the Baby Yoda cocktails. Jesse dropped down the perfect, perfect looking one. And it tasted delicious, too. And that's the thing. Yeah, he can throw down, man, and, and, and a complete surprise too. We had no idea. Like we were, we were kind of watching what he was doing, but not you know paying close attention. And all of a sudden, he pops us down in front of us. He's he's fabulous. He's fabulous. I have a vivid picture of him at the Doran several years ago in a velvet purple blazer with an appropriate matching bow tie, flipping blue flames from mm. glass to glass, pour to pour. And I I remember thinking, man, that's that's great. You know, I don't do that. That's not me. I no, sing, but, but I don't really no. dance. Kid can yeah. dance as well. Yeah. There is an element of, of showmanship sometimes to bartending, you know, to, to make cocktails. I mean, I think that, uh, God, what was, I've completely forgot until I just said that now, until I said that sentence, I forgot that old Tom Cruise movie, which I've never actually seen, but. It's, uh, you're talking about Michael, Michael, um, Michael Caine and that, Tom Cruise. Is that it? I've never seen it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. They're throwing bottles back and forth behind the bar like they're bowling pins. I forgot all and, about and that. And I you know, get, I get, I get that a lot. I get the, you know, you remind me of right now. And it's, I think it's an energy thing. I look nothing like Tom Cruise. I'm certainly about a foot taller, but um, yeah, like it's, it's an energy thing. The showmanship, I feel yeah. like I'm, I'll, I'll throw a 10 over my shoulder. 
I'll flip it in hand, but I'm not doing much more than that because the time and attention that goes into building a cocktail at home and creating something good that you want to share in public takes a lot of time and a lot of concentration. Um, and I can't put that time into flipping cups and balancing stuff on my arm. I've got to put it into making a perfect drink. So absolutely, um, I don't believe that's true for everyone, but that's true for me. No, oh, yeah, exactly. Different people do different things. I mean, that's that's the, the absolutely. Answer. Yeah, I, I think you know down that avenue, it's something that you know combines the the the, the palate and the skill of creating a cocktail, and also a little bit of that showmanship. Are the cocktail competitions that uh, I've had a blast uh, judging over the years? Uh, I, I've lost track of how many I've done, and they're always so wonderful. We did a you did great mine last summer. Right. I was going to say, we did a great one last year, and I love that. Thank, I love thank, that. You for, thank you for participating in Sling. We really appreciated that. That was a blast. I really enjoyed that a lot. Uh, it was a great group of cocktailers. Uh, a really a, a fantastic – all the drinks were fantastic. Uh, though the, the, the winner was uh, – Yeah. She, she's, uh, she's special, Annalise. Yeah, she's Annalise. Yeah. One, of, one of the many talented people I want to get back to work as soon as possible. Well, I mean, not just back to work, but hopefully soon we can do events like that again. I, you know, I mean, uh, my my business has sadly come to a temporary end. Um, you yeah, know, hopefully, you know, yeah. we'll see we'll see what the time comes. But I, I think it's a ways away before we see a hundred people in a room, uh, which is what those type of competitions need to be exciting and vibrant. And uh, I think it was I think just we need uh, to be, um, I think we need to be versatile at this time, David. True. Um, I, I, a lot of people are pivoting, myself included. I've adjusted the model of my work, and I'm trying to bring the show to people at this point. And yeah. I'm doing it every week. Um, I, I bring people what they need to their home. And I consult with them in advance, and I talk to them about their needs, what they're comfortable with. I ask the same questions I would ask if they were sitting at my bar. And I bring them what they could taste uh, to their home. The only difference is I'm not – on premise, I'm at their premise, and mm -hmm. I'm not in a shirt and tie. I'm in a hat and a baseball cap, a baseball cap and a button down or a hoodie or whatever, and I bring them what they need. Um, it's I take for granted, and I'm sure you don't, David, but I take for granted. It's my work environment, but it where I work is their play place. People with children, people with pets, people with in-laws, people with mortgages, people that live. In the suburban areas in our state, they travel to see me for a reason. They would never tell you on paper that it's to see me if they don't want to. It's half of it. Um, but the other half is when they taste something that reminds them of being out, it doesn't matter whether I'm there or not. It matters that it reminds them of being out. I've been working hard on that from home last several weeks. Right. Yeah, no, I've seen uh, your photos. And, and so you're essentially batching – Everything but the liquor? Is that how, how, how are you doing it? Yeah. Danny, you want to grab me one of those jars? Um, so I'm, I've gone to, you know, it's, I'm in Southeastern Mass in quarantine. Uh, day 52 or three now. Thank you so yeah, much. I've lost, lost track. And um, I've taken the time to basically build infusions so that people can have something unique at home. You know, anyone can make a cocktail. Even people that feel a little bit confident, they can make a decent drink for me or you at home. You know, probably be very good. I'm making something you probably won't think of or make for yourself at home. So I'll give you a quick zoom in right here. This is a five citrus infused oh, yeah. tequila. There is a premium silver tequila in the citrus of those five fruits indicated there. Uh, the name at the bottom is, is the, the recipient. It sits for 48 hours. The juice from those fruits does not get wasted. It goes into a Vitamix. I cheese cloth it. I put it into a jar with a little bit of vodka and simple syrup, and I taste it. For about two days, keeping it cold, of course. And what I get is a cordial. A cordial gets is basically like the Grand Marnier, a coin throw of, a, of, in this case, a margarita. So this jar and a smaller jar next to it of that red, beautiful juice that came from these fruits and a little bag of sea salt gets elastic band to the top here, gets delivered. This has four and a half drinks. It's 45 bucks. And all they got to do is put two ounces of this and one ounce of the side jar next to it, shake it, and pour it out. And they're going to have something they couldn't get anywhere else. Uh, same concurrently with this English cucumber. Nice. Uh, Mediterranean sea salt and cracked pepper. And then Old Reliable. Those Capitol Grill fans out there, or anyone that likes to just enjoy pineapple, very basic. Soli doli. I'm a Kettle One guy, so when it comes to the vodkas, I use Kettle One or Broken Shed. With regards to the tequila, I use Altos because it's affordable. It's really good quality to price ratio. 
larger format, 30 to 35 bucks at a big liquor store, you can't miss. Um, so that's what I'm doing. And I've got, um, I've got several different styles. One of the most popular ones is called the brown drink. I do cherry heron coin tro, and I use a rye and bitters. And I leave orange peel in that mixture for three days. And then I pre-cut perfect garnishes, wrap them in a um, wet paper towel, Ziploc bag, again, elastic band that to the jar, and give it to the recipient. Um, these are craft cocktails in your home using premium ingredients, premium process. Um, it's just being done in advance. And I really am genuinely sad about the forecast right now, David. And if I don't find a way, and people like me don't find a way, shout out to Ryan Drain at Ed Brady's establishment. Shout out to Ryan Wilkie of Ten Steak and Sushi and Chow Fun. These guys are doing something similar right now. We're not in direct contact. I haven't spoken to them, but I'm aware from watching the channels of similar efforts on their behalf. Um, if we don't do this, we lose the work that's naturally taken place um, in the craft cocktail and fine dining establishments over the last decade. And yeah. we're, we're less than 60 days into this process. Um, I'm able to offer these at a price that's actually almost 20% below sticker value in the environment before gratuity. So I'm actually able to save people money, give them a memento, something they can have now or two weeks from now, but they've got a craft cocktail at home from Mills Tavern or from the cocktail writer or from Matt Simmons or wherever they imagine I work or remember. And the value of that is the consciousness the consumer has locally. Their propensity to open their wallet, believe it or not, is not as important as remembering the places they liked and the people they saw while they were out. That is what gets someone to go out. Um, this sip, this sip right here, gives someone a reminder right. of their, why they spend their money, where they take their loved ones, uh, what about an environment is charming to them. Because 80% of taste is smell. And the way a place smells when you walk into it is the same reason you buy a steak or a drink. Um, I really encourage anyone that's trying to execute the way I'm at home and the way Ryan Drain and Ryan Wilkie are um, for themselves outside of you know, their furloughing or, or layoffs, which we're all experiencing. And I, I implore people to, if you can't afford something like this, direct message me, email David and say, hey, who do you recommend I talk to? We will send you in the right direction. We will give you a recipe. Um, when things do get normal, and I think it's much later this year, David, the reason people will go back out is because they have had reminders right. um, in the gap between basically March 15th and whenever you can see more than 50 people in a restaurant again, yeah. what we do to stay mentally present and conscious about the things we love and things we remember in these spaces all comes down to the efforts of interviews like this that we're experiencing now. Thank you again, David, for having me. And my efforts at home to make infusions and deliver them once a week. Um, I'm not making much money off of this, but I know it means a lot. I can tell by the look on people's faces when I walk up to their door, I hand that bag, it says, quarantine cocktail. I'm going to adjust that soon. I think it's a little polarizing, but yeah. it's good for marketing now and it keeps cocktails on people's minds and um, keeps me active. And there's a symbiosis there that we, we can't lose or let go of. It's, there's a reason that Pat and Patsy on Broadway were able to open up Slow Road. Dan Becker was able to open up Great Northern and the Royal Bobcat. There's a reason he was able to afford the renovations of the Duck and Bunny. There's a reason that Brian Kingsford was able to, to take over the Pacarang space up above his Bacara restaurant. It's because people go and spend money, have confidence in these people and places, and allows them to expand. If we lose that love, if we lose that visibility, we're not going to be able to repair the erosion that we're experiencing. And I'm very yeah. worried about that. It's very true. But I, I do think, uh, again, going back to the size and the community here, uh, the size of Rhode Island, hopefully – we're not going to lose that. You know, I think the consumer out there still really misses and loves a lot of these places, but what you're doing is that's key. That's important. I, I'm reminded as you, as you talk about the senses and all of that great scene at the end of Ratatouille. I mean, it's such a simple little thing, but when, when he takes that bite and, it, and, and they, they show that immediate flashback to how that food brings all these memories back into his head. Uh, it's a great scene. It's a great little quick 30 second, you know, 60 second, Show it's a microcosm, man. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's a microcosm. It's um, 80% of taste is smell. And smell is like, if you talk to a psychologist, that line to memory. 
not sight, it's smell. Because if you can't see, your nose will remember for you. Right. Um, and that's that's powerful. That's yeah. so powerful. No, absolutely true. I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to keep this interview series a little more uh, light and personal, but you know, obviously we're in a tough situation here. I mean, what do you think? Uh, what What is your view for the next few months and and the next year? I mean, what do you, what do you what are you seeing? What are you thinking? We were just talking a moment ago about pivoting, um, the home delivery. I used my jars as an example and itemized a couple locals doing something similar. I had a call yesterday with Philly Moon, actually, who I mentioned earlier on, on this interview, um, uh, formerly a Blaze restaurant and a, and a wildly talented uh, at-home private caterer and chef. You know, we spoke for about 10 minutes yesterday, and the narrative, I hate the word narrative, but I'll use it, the narrative really is we have to pivot. We have to pivot right now. Um, if you if you just kicked down a wall and took over your neighbor's space and you're occupying 3,000 square feet, you just got another 800 or 900 square feet, and you were gonna, you know, you were gonna open up another LLC. You need to put jars and fresh baked goods and homemade candy and local honey and chutney. You need to make your own stuff in your kitchen, which you hopefully own and, and have the rights to, and sell your stuff out of there. That's a pivot if you're in retail. If you're if you're not able to go work in retail, you need to do what I'm doing. If you're a private chef, you need to do what Philly Moon did yesterday and call me and say, hey, how about I do the food, you do the drinks. When someone calls about drinks, you tell them about food, and I'll do the same for you. The fact of the matter is, um, and again, it is unfortunate, you have to recognize, David, I'm sure you know this, that the lion's share of money that affords the retail environment, such as a Mills Tavern, a Cafe Nuovo, Siena restaurants, even in, even a place um, in the middle, like a Nixon on Broadway that attracts a, a broader demographic, understand that two-thirds of that income, up to 40% or more on a given shift or service, rather, comes from a de- demographic that is no longer comfortable going out. Yeah. At least they're not now, and they're not going to be soon. Those people are adjusting their wills, adjusting their professional realities to being at home. They're telling their families to come visit them. I'm not meeting you anywhere. And that again, narrative is not going to change. And because that's not going to change, do not expect the 30-somethings that have less money are marginally, or to a more substantial bottom line, less established, to float the bill. You can't keep Mills Tavern open without a billion-dollar company behind it. No more than you could keep Siena open without having two or three locations that are doing takeout. You've got to have something to catch the bills. how do we how do we address this? Um, we address it by sending the experience home, bringing the experience to the customer. Our laws have to be adjusted. Yeah, we have to yeah. be able to bring cocktails home. We have to change not the open container law, but we have to get with the local distributors and talk about the laws, specifically in this state. I don't want to get all political, but by loosening those laws, adjusting the mandates and the statutes in place so that our taxable infrastructure can be repaired. Again, just 60 days in, the damage we've experienced for some is irreparable. And for, it will become irreparable for many in a matter of days. Um, I, I pray that we, we are able to figure that out. Now, I, I mitigate and adjust with at-home cocktail delivery. I think that a private chef that has to close their bistro, they start delivering dinners at home, and they network with people like me again. I think it has to start there, and I think you have to have really good, honest dialogue with McLaughlin Moran, MS Walker, Horizon Beverage, and you're like, hey, listen, in a year's time, you're going to lose a third of your sales staff because you're not going to need them. Yeah. And what are you going to do to make sure your warehouse stays full, that you take those full-time employees, you don't fire a third of them, you just cut down all of their work, drop all of their pay scale a little bit so they can keep a job, they can keep their benefits, they can do something else on the side. It's all about a pivot. Um, I was speaking with a local property owner and manager, who I'll leave nameless, uh, who has heavy holdings in downtown Providence yesterday. And what he said to me basically is, this year, unfortunately, is a wash for the retail world. That the soonest you will see an influx of repairable dividends is the Christmas season. Right. I was going to say, maybe if we're lucky, the holiday season will redeem this year. Maybe. In the Western world, we already look forward 30 days to our next holidays, to our next season change. Usually 30 days out, we think, oh, just a couple of weeks, it'll be X, Y, and Z. 
the same way in March we go, oh, don't worry, it'll be warm soon. July 4th, we say, don't, don't blink, it'll be September 1 soon. So with that kind of a mentality in the North, Northeast and Western world, we really need to consider what's happening financially. If people aren't spending money in the middle of July on a 4th of July backyard barbecue, no, no one's buying a 120-pound cake for 150 people to enjoy with a chopped up watermelon and everyone brings a bottle on the bar. If that's not happening, no one's buying a pig, no one's buying a watermelon, no one's bringing a bottle to the party. So all that revenue is being saved and withheld by the consumer. The retail is going to suffer. I don't have an absolute answer to how to mitigate that, but to protect, protect infrastructure, to keep lights on and potholes filled, money's got to get spent. Oh yeah. We've got to adjust the rules of distribution of service, consumption of products, um, and make sure that everyone's getting served, that people are getting tipped. Um, there are lots of there are lots of rules keeping people from doing that legally, and that's that's something for Mr. Stefan Pryor and Ms. Gina Raimondo and our our senators and congressmen, Mr. Langevin, Cicilline, Mr. Reed, and Mr. Whitehouse. They all need to get in a room and have a conversation because their jobs. This is the hardest job they've ever had, but this is why they have a job. Yeah. Um, I will be watching and looking to those those people over the next six months to see the suggestions that they accept and the responses they offer to people like me when we talk about these these issues. What do you think, David? Uh, what are your well, what crosses your mind? I mean, I, I've had some conversations with with uh, some of these folks that you just mentioned, some of our elected officials, and uh, I, I think we need to look at some form of revenue replacement because either way the government's going to be paying for this. Either they're not going to be collecting sales tax and, and the beverage tax, you know, the, the, the 1% on top, the food and beverage tax. Uh, and that's going to be obviously drastically affecting the income for the state, or they're going to be paying out a ton of unemployment to a lot of sadly laid off people. So one way or another, uh, the government has to come to some form of, uh, adjustment uh, because the money's going to come out of the, you know, I hate to say it. I mean, the number of people on unemployment right now is only going to go up, uh, especially yeah. as the summer goes on and events are not happening. I mean, you think of all these catering companies, all this the entire event infrastructure, tents, uh, photographers, you know, bakers, uh, you know, like I said, catering companies, the number of people that work for those types of event companies uh, especially here during the summer months and into well into October uh, is huge. And there'll be so many of them unemployed and there needs to be some, I mean, I, I don't, I don't mean bailout. I don't think that's a great term. And, but I think, you know, if we're able to financially assist these giant companies with tax credits and things of that nature, then perhaps we need to refocus uh, onto these smaller businesses treating this, you know, this, this entity of smaller businesses as a single entity. Yeah, I agree. It's difficult. Uh, I'm not, I'm not saying it's I not difficult. This, this is our first time going through this. Say yeah. that again. Well, I'm not saying it won't be difficult. I, I, you know, I'm not saying, you know, it's a perfect answer, but, and there's still a lot of unknowns, but it's gotta be done. To your, to your point you were just making, um, I, I, I know this is the first time we've ever gone through this. This is, as everyone's saying it, it's unprecedented. It's unprecedented. That's understood. I think that um, having an arbiter or a mitigator between disbursement and amounts and allocations of federal funds is something that has been a miss and missing from the process. Um, you know, when when smaller businesses miss out on SBA loans, and you're like, oh, don't worry, you'll get the next round. Sometimes, sometimes a lease payment is due. Yeah. or an insurance payment, or a payroll disbursement is due. If people can't afford it, um, they close. Yeah. I think, I think that I couldn't believe the large corporate bailouts that happened right away and how quickly those bounced back. I, you know, in, 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 two weeks, in two weeks, $170 million went out and came back. And that was amazing to me to watch, to, to think that, this crack squad that all these corporations have of accountants and attorneys couldn't have the foresight for a federal indictment a year, 24 months from now. It's like, why would you take the check? Why would you apply for the process? Because of due process? 
Okay, I get that. Maybe your accountants say, hey, apply for the money, get the money, send it back. Shows that if you have a problem in the future, you, you made your efforts and you did the right thing. The reality is, why bother in the first place? You know, if you're the Los Angeles Lakers, why are you going to take $5 million? Why do the Los Angeles Lakers even apply for a five million? That's a signing bonus to an Apex player. Come on. What are we talking about? So to me, to me, the socioeconomics is backwards. It's been backwards. Well, um, yes, I was just saying, it's been backwards for a long time. Yeah. 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 yeah, it absolutely has. Well, I don't want to go too far down the Google path. We could we could go down that path for quite some no, time. No, we don't want to. I, but it, it right. also sounds like it's nice to hear. It sounds like your financial background definitely continues to percolate in your head there, and it's very helpful, I think. It does. Um, I don't stop thinking about – it's helped me a lot, David, honestly. When it comes to purchasing glassware for an establishment, uh, leveraging a case incentive, utilizing relationship management skills, all of these things have, um, have benefited me and, and hopefully the clients I've worked with as well. Um, Black Infusions from Natick, Massachusetts. They have a, a, a fig and an apricot vodka. Um, oh, yeah. Some of these you may have seen it around. Really fabulous products. They were the first people to give me a job as a brand ambassador. Uh, I consulted on the development of the apricot, the bottling style, the labeling, everything. Um, that all came from a background in business relationship management and banking. I've been really lucky uh, to have found a way to leverage those skills. Thank you for noticing that. So I like to, uh, I've got a questionnaire that I based on the old inside the actual studio questionnaire that I like to end each interview. Oh, with. do it. That's great. That's you ready? <laughs> I, 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 I've adapted it a little bit, but so uh, it, it, it's, you'll, you'll recognize some of it. So let's start with uh, what is your favorite word? My favorite word? Man. You know, um, there's a time and a place for everything, right? So one of my favorite words is appropriate or appropriate because the analytical mind I have without judging anyone else has a sense of what can be appropriated, whether it be physical, uh, intentional, intrinsic. I think appropriate might be one of my favorite words. Interesting. I have a friend who says I use it too often, but whatever. <laughs> your favorite. That's your favorite. What is your, least, what is your least favorite word? Um, my least favorite word. My least favorite word. What is my least favorite word? Um, no. I don't like the word no. And that makes sense. I work in a oh, yes business. So. Absolutely right. The word no. Right. Yeah. What turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Um, what turns me on creatively? Um, what turns me on creatively is something I haven't thought of, something I haven't considered, an adjustment to something that exists, but suddenly there's a new valuation. Um, that's creatively. Uh, spiritually, I think what really lights my spirit up is the human condition's well willingness to not forget the neighbor, not forget that what you do doesn't work for everyone else, and, and when people exhibit the ability to meet in the middle and of their own volition they go out of their way independently to act in a way that is respectful of those around them some call it a liberal mentality some call it democratic i prefer to stay away from those labels but i think what spiritually turns me on is is the human conditions acknowledgement of one another and acting according what was the last one uh that, 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 that i think that covers everything there the, the next question okay, is yeah. what turns you off um, what turns me off? Um, I think carbon copies under mass consumption. I think when you don't have a reason for doing something, I think the effort and the intention are lost. So if I, so if I, if someone says Tito's and soda and I say why, and they don't have an answer, I'm there to serve them, but I'm like, damn, I can't imagine taking a drop of anything down my throat if I don't know what it is and why I'm drinking it. So what turns me off is a lack of intention. All right. What is your favorite curse word? Fuck. That seems to be the popular one, yeah. Everyone says that one. Fuck. Just... <laughs> what sound or noise do you love? Um, 
sound or noise that I love? Um, you know, sound or noise that I love. I think like a ding or a bing. You know, whether it's a, a cash register or the toaster, it means that there's a finality about a process. Maybe Venmo just went off. Uh, something in the oven is completed. Time to check on it. I think Bing means, hey, you need to look into this. Something good's happening. I like that. Bing. <laughs> what sound or noise do you hate? Um, sound or noise do I hate? Oh, dial-up modems. <laughs> or or, or the, the sound a cured coffee machine makes. Are, does that thing, that is, that, I'm not going to, I'm not going to like rep, try and make my effort of what it sounds like, but no, man, yeah. it's the, it's the current, the Keurig coffee machine is the current version of a mid nineties dial up modem. And that we can office space that. I mean, I don't know if anyone on here has seen office space. <laughs> the point is a Louisville slugger and a bad attitude. And that thing can die behind your house or office. All right. Yeah. I like that. What is your favorite ingredient? My favorite ingredient. Oh man, that's tough. Yeah. Favorite ingredient? Yeah. Oh man. I'm gonna go with food for I'm gonna go with food, not beverage. Um duck fat. Solid answer. Solid answer. Duck fat duck is fat. Yeah. duck fat, because you can use it with all in all kinds of ways. Yep, solid answer. What is your least favorite ingredient? My least favorite ingredient. Do we really need black licorice? <laughs> or the flavor profile? Don't we, isn't anise and fennel enough? I'm sorry. For those who disagree, we can just disagree. Black licorice, man. It, first of all, it, it's darker than your TV set. Yeah. The format is almost like inconsumable unless you reduce it it gets stuck in your teeth and it's impossible to cleanse your palate so black licorice i'm sorry right. if we gotta like if something's gonna go overboard you can throw the whole barrel all right what profession other than your own would you like to attempt i i'm a retired amateur baseball player um my body still is thankfully pretty healthy and fit um my first step isn't what it used to be but maybe if i could have one profession that weren't my i think i might look into either coaching or if i could rewind maybe i'd play baseball a little longer yeah yeah as a profession by being compensated right yeah, yeah. yeah what profession would you not like to do Corrections. Yeah. I mean, criminal justice degree is a noble pursuit. It's a never-ending job. But um, I don't know, man. Someone else can cage the beast. And the last question, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? <sighs> if heaven exists, what would I like to hear God say to me? When I arrive at the pearly gates. Um, being a Christian or being a cat raised a Catholic, um, you know, we're told we're not perfect, but just give it our best. I'd like to be told I did a decent job treating other people as I wanted to be treated. I think uh, that goes back to, you know, spiritual respect for your neighbor and fellow man. I'd like to be told I did a decent job. Very nice. I like that. Well, Matt, this has been a great conversation. I really appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you for joining me. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, David. Is this your, how many you got today? Uh, just this one today. And then, uh, like I said, I'm hoping to have John, John Scambato on next. Uh, but uh, it's been great talking to folks, and I really, really enjoy it. So thank you. Yeah, I, I, hope, I hope I was able to add some value to your series here. I really appreciate the time and the questions, David. Thanks so much for uh, giving me a look, for lack of a better word. <laughs> My pleasure, sir. Take care. Hey, I'll, Take talk, care. I'll talk to you soon, Dave. Take care. Absolutely. Bye-bye.